Renaissance people. If you are enjoying the Italian Renaissance podcast, I have good news. We're now active on Patreon. You can show your love for the show by becoming a patron and get access to additional resources, information, and artworks. Better yet, those who join the Renaissance Master or Renaissance Patron tier will get access to at least one additional podcast episode each month. My goal is to ensure that the main podcast remains a free, accessible source for everyone. Become a patron today through the link in the show notes to support the continued production of new episodes and help build and maintain this community. The Italian Renaissance Shop is now also active on Etsy, linked in the show notes. Sport our logo or choose from a growing selection of Italian art-inspired designs. Discounts are offered to select Patreon tiers as well. Your support has my immortal gratitude. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Italian Renaissance Podcast, where we discuss essential topics about the art and culture of 15th and 16th century Italy. I'm your host, Lawrence Cianangeli. Andiamo avanti. Welcome back, Renaissance lovers. We have really been digging deeply into the nitty-gritty, talking on very specific topics and sorting through a mass of cultural content, mostly with what concerns Florence, but a bit of Rome and Venice sprinkled in. I think it's time to zoom out a little bit and take a step back and look at big picture concepts that we can use as a tool in looking at most of the Italian peninsula during the Renaissance period, mainly what it inherits from the Middle Ages. That is the cult of saints. The scope of this podcast is mostly focused on movements and figures that draw from antiquity, be it Bacchus, Venus, or David in the Atlantica style, um, which emulates the, the Greeks and Romans. We define the Renaissance as that type of classical revival, but it is only one that works in complete reconciliation with the major cultural and religious code that is predominant in the 1400s. That is to say that it is not just as if classical antiquity picked up where it left off before Christianity, but that the, the Renaissance combines the two, producing this wholly unique cultural entity that is filled with even smaller, more specific subcultures or uh, cultural varieties that blossom within their own contexts, uh, often in terms of how their Christianity is practiced, such as uh, you may see in the Republic of Venice or Florence or the Papal States, Pisa, Bologna, Milan, etc. It is absolutely essential that you understand what the existing culture was and frankly continues to be throughout the Christian world in part. So I want to detail the role of Christian saints in Renaissance culture throughout the 1400s and up to the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s. It is very common in the United States specifically to incorrectly associate Catholicism as different from general Christianity. Um, and nothing can, can be more untrue than that. So the modern Catholic Church is an extension of everything that came before the Reformation in all of Western Christianity. All of the variations that we know today, with the exception of the Eastern Orthodox Church, um, which has its own complicated history, they don't arrive until the next century after when we're talking about. Okay, A major division today among Christian sects is how saints are being perceived or worshipped. In fact, understanding the culture around saints in the Renaissance is an absolute must to fully understand the period. They cannot be left out or disregarded, but rather one who engages this period should learn to identify their iconography and know how to recognize them. What do I mean by iconography? This is an important word for art historical study. These are the way images are used to help identify figures or symbols in painting, sculpture, architecture. Okay, The easiest ones are those of, say, Jesus Christ, who uh, may have a, a cross, a crown of thorns, a, 
a halo with a crucifix in it, or any combination thereof. Those are symbols of his iconography. Holy images needed to be readable and understandable by the more illiterate crowd, who inherited their faith simply by looking at church decoration or, uh, more importantly, being told how to interpret the religious text by clergy who could read. It seems that lay folk were not really permitted to read or interpret Christian literature for themselves. That's the role of art in the early church, right? Also, every city, every town, every village has its own patron saint, a saint who the town claims to be the chief figure watching over them, more or less, God being the exception, of course. Every saint, and there are hundreds, has a corresponding day on the calendar to represent their feast day. And to this day in Italy, I think even some parts of the United States too, um, each town has a festival to celebrate the patron saint of their city or town and are treated as public holidays. For example, the patron saint of the city of Florence is St. John the Baptist, or San Giovanni Battista, right? And what that means is that June the 24th is the festival of St. John the Baptist in Florence, and in every other town that also takes him as their patron saint. Even in the United States, we celebrate Ogni Santi, All Saints Day, on November the 1st. This is the day that every saint gets recognized apart from their individual feast days. I'm frankly more of an October 31st kind of guy, spooky all the way, but for Catholics, it's a day of uh, holy reverence for every saint worshipped across the Catholic world. There are a lot of factors that contribute to how saint patronage is attributed. Uh, this part is important. A large portion of saint worship in the Renaissance and Middle Ages revolves around what are called relics. What are relics, I hear you ask? They are typically the physical remains or pieces of a saint's body. Creepy, right? Like, uh, ew. <laughs> but if you enter any church throughout the Christian world that follows the cult of saints, there's a very high chance that they have human remains inside of their church, contained in what is called a reliquary. So a reliquary can take many shapes, sizes, and materials. They're usually lavish or extremely expensive, adorned with gold, gems, what have you. Uh, now let me clarify, relics do not always have human remains. In fact, they're often absolutely obviously fraudulent objects. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome claims to have the original objects used in the crucifixion of Jesus. Believe what you will, but come on guys, let's be serious here. There's no real way those objects could have been acquired. So it's either going to be body parts or um, objects of questionable nature. Items like wood or a piece of a crown of thorns or something. Just like throughout Europe, you will find so many pieces of small wooden relics claiming to be pieces from the true cross that uh, the one used to use, crucify Jesus, right? The true cross, it's called, that you could probably construct more than one single full-size Roman cross across the collection of wood pieces claiming to be relics from the crucifixion. So it's not all icky and corpsey. What would be the point of fabricating or being willfully ignorant about a relic's authenticity? What was a town in this period without a proper relic? It wouldn't be ideal because part of the use of relics is revenue. A town could situate itself for economic prosperity if it had a relic that would draw in pilgrims. Pilgrimage is essentially one's individual quest to visit holy sites for religious fulfillment. This is partly what causes the Crusades, given that Jerusalem was the pinnacle of pilgrimage sites in the world for, the, for Christians. If the Christians could take it back, then they could open the path to fulfill one of the most holy journeys there is. However, with pilgrimage to Jerusalem out of the question, places like Rome 
and Santiago de Compostela, which is in modern-day Spain, they rose to become the most important sites for pilgrimage. And all of this was established throughout the Middle Ages, more or less, so that by the Renaissance we have a fairly established cult of saints, known patronage, highly sought-after relics for pilgrimage, as well as established pilgrimage routes through dozens of monasteries and other holy sites that are still walkable trails today since long before the Renaissance. So who were the saints and how were they established? This is an extremely complex history that can be studied in better detail through what is called hagiography. Hagiography is the writing on the lives of the saints. The single most important text on saints' lives is called The Golden Legend by an author named Jacobus de Voragine. Um, and this was compiled in the, the latter half of the 1200s. Translations are widely available in English, and a large number of saints and their stories are recorded there, uh, however embellished as they may be. So between written hagiography and an absurd amount of local folklore and individual provincial religious practices, the cult of the saints is still alive and well today. Some saints earned their sainthood through their labor and theological practice. Probably the most important saint from the Middle Ages is St. Augustine of Hippo, who wrote a large series of theological treatises that became widely accepted throughout Christendom. Other saints can be figures directly from the Bible, such as the Apostles of Jesus. But, uh, and this is where the fun begins, an absurdly large number of saints earn their title through what is called martyrdom, which includes biblical figures too. What does that mean exactly? Bluntly, they were killed in some way in service to the Christian God. These martyrdoms are usually told in some kind of fantastical or violent way, and they usually contain a miracle within them that gives um, a saintliness or a holiness to the martyrs. My namesake, uh, St. Lawrence, was famously grilled alive. The thing is, I I really like to grill out, so I kind of wonder about that myself. There's usually a, a miraculous deed involved, as I said. So as the legend goes, after some time on the grill, Lawrence declares that his, his backside is cooked and that they'll need to turn him over. He's funny, like me. And just as the place can take, uh, just as a place can take a patron saint, so can occupations. Um, and hobbies. So what that means is St. Lawrence is the patron saint of cooking and of chefs, which is horribly ironic, of course, which is the point, um, among many other titles linked to his own theology, right? But because he was grilled. Do we get it? Do we, do we understand that? Um, but in this story, regardless of the, the kind of miraculous um, way that he was able to sustain the grill marks em enough to still unleash his sense of humor, um, we are meant to understand his pain, his agony of slowly being cooked alive for his faith as being like Christ, who also suffered during his passion, right? It is that suffering in combination with their works for the Christian cause that elevates them to sainthood. And there's dozens and dozens of stories like this. And these histories are extremely interesting to get into. Um, another example was St. Sebastian, who was strung up and shot full of arrows, or Santa Lucia, who had her eyes plucked out. St. Catherine of Alexandria was tortured on some horrible spiked wheel. I want to point out that women are very often venerated as saints, uh, their chief in this hierarchy, of course, being Santa Maria, the Virgin Mary, right, Saint Mary. This all links back to their iconography and to the cult of relics. These saints in art are almost always identifiable by the way they were martyred in their presence bleeds into elite society. 
So let's look at this in detail through our um, reoccurring um, nobles, the Medici, the Basilica of San Lorenzo, St. Lawrence, in Florence is diagonal from the Medici Palace, and both are contained within the neighborhood called San Lorenzo because of the basilica, right? Um, it's not a coincidence that there are more than one Lorenzo in the Medici family, including the one and only Lorenzo the Magnificent, uh, so that his name is distinctly linked to a person, San Lorenzo, St. Lawrence, and the place, both the Basilica of San Lorenzo and the neighborhood of San Lorenzo where the palace was. Okay. Likewise, um, although from the 1500s, I don't know uh, what was there before, but an enormous painting by Bronzino decorates the Basilica, showing uh, in what is known as the Mannerist style, this weird wonky thing that happens in the 1500s we can talk about later. Um, the painting is called The Martyrdom of St. Lawrence. Through his iconography, the gridiron, right, for grilling, one can immediately know the subject matter of the painting. In the same way, you will always see St. Sebastian bound and full of arrows. Saints' iconography uh, are often unmistakable. Don't get me wrong, other times you're completely confused by the iconography. It takes time, patience, and a very watchful and keen eye. Oftentimes, the church relics correspond to the name of the church, though I cannot say for sure if San Lorenzo has any relics of, uh, well, the Saint San Lorenzo. Yet, if we look at the Cathedral of Venice, San Marco, that is, Saint Mark the Apostle, they claim to have recovered his body and that the cathedral is the tomb of the saint. I want to stress that you cannot generally refer to large churches as cathedrals. Uh, the cathedral is specifically the principal church that is the seat of the bishop, right? So a city will only ever have one cathedral, and it serves as a central place of power and worship for that bishop's diocese or district. I often hear people whimsically interchange the word church and cathedral, and it's just not correct. So be aware of that. So the Cathedral of Venice is San Marco. The, the Vatican has St. Peter's or San Pietro, and Florence has Santa Maria del Fiore, so on and so forth. And this is uh, critical to Renaissance art because such a substantial amount of patronage is in the decoration of these holy places. Renaissance art is not all ancient mythology, but rather an amazingly vast collection of highly devotional works around saints, be it fresco cycles, altarpieces, sculptures, ceiling vaults, you name it, it's there. What is of particular importance is how artists choose to depict the saints as the cultural norms start to change, which is a large task to do. It's something you need to develop really over time. But let's look at a specific example to compare stylistic changes. Another saint, St. John the Baptist, is a simple one. Although he was gruesomely martyred by having his head lopped off at the request of Salome, and that subject is thoroughly covered in painting, he is usually depicted in his more dignified state, with his head attached, right? And he's always shown wearing the skin of an animal. That's how you can always identify him, okay? I want us to look at a work by the painter Filippino Lippi from around 1485 showing the Annunciation and featuring St. John the Baptist, which is odd in itself. We'll get there. And we're going to compare it to a work that's more than 20 years later by Leonardo da Vinci, right? So we can examine one way, at least, that religious subject matter can be changed and reshaped in the Renaissance. We're going to just do a visual analysis with, with some minor context. I really want to get at the heart of how these two images are similar and different. So the first one, like I said, I'm looking at is an, the Annunciation with St. John the Baptist and St. Andrew by the artist Filippino Lippi. 
So try to get this image in front of you. Try to get a look at it. Um, it's showing what is known as an Annunciation, and that is when the angel Gabriel comes down to the private garden of the Virgin Mary to announce that she is going to um, bear Christ, who is going to redeem the world. Pretty intense moment. And in the majority of these images, it's, it's not common, at least it depends, right, um, to have these other saints here. Right, and we get the title with St. John the Baptist because here on the left, what do we have? We have a figure, his hand raised in um, some sort of gesture towards the scene at hand in the middle. He's wearing that animal skin. Do you see it on his chest? Right, and he also always has that long, very skinny, very thin cross. Okay, he's also got a halo. This is going to position him as a holy figure. This is an easy identification, or at least it should be, right? Um, St. John the Baptist is frequently going to be depicted like this. A little prior to this, you might find that halo would be a little more solid, his pose would be a little more um, stiff, but Filippino Lippi was trained by his father, Filippo Lippi, who was an early Renaissance painter, and this is also in the same school as Botticelli, right? Um, in the middle, Gabriel presents the um, lily to Mary. And on the right is St. Andrew. And we can identify St. Andrew because the, he is holding the tool of his martyrdom. He was crucified. Okay. Now, um, for those of you who are familiar with the St. Andrew's cross in a different context, okay, that might indicate that realistically this cross in this depiction um, may not be accurate to the type that was used to crucify him. Okay, so here we have this Annunciation, and in the background, you might have to zoom in, but it is the city of Florence. It's got the dome, you can see the tower of the Bargello, you can see the Plaza Vecchio, okay, and you can see the Apennine Mountains in the background. So we know that historically, literarily, mythologically, Mary did not live in Florence. So there's something being said here about including St. John the Baptist, the patron saint of Florence, right, in this Annunciation that takes Filippino Lippi, Florentine artist, and contextualizes this religious moment in his city being looked over by the patron saint of his city, right? so that John the Baptist is serving a very specific and local devotional role in this composition. Okay? Does that make sense? So, keep in mind, the iconography, the f animal body, cloak, thing, <laughs> I don't know, fur vest, his halo, his little crook, I suppose maybe we can call it, um, from this from 1485, but then if we look at Leonardo da Vinci's St. John the Baptist from about 1513, something of the sort, it's extremely weird. It is extremely bizarre. It is super dark, okay? That is something called tenebrism, right? Tenebrismo. And where is he? He's not in a scene from the Bible. He's deeply, deeply put into shadow. Chiaroscuro, remember chiaroscuro, remember sfumato, the delicate blurring of the lines. He does have his animal skin, it's just falling off of his shoulder, wrapping around his arm, and he's pointing to himself, and in the hand that he's pointing to himself, he's got that traditional crook. We've identified him, right? There is no doubt that this is anyone other than St. John the Baptist, okay? But he's an individual in this moment, and he's pointing up. And what he's saying is, through me, you can achieve heaven, right? You can achieve grace. You can achieve, um, what do we call this? Some kind of... Uh, salvation. 
We talked about humanism. We talked about replacing the individual, right, into culture, how humanism is impacting the existing religious underbelly. These examples give us some insight on not only how saints are expressed visually, but how that expression adapts and changes with the innovations of the time. A lot of this has to do with humanism, the value of the individual that Leonardo expresses with his John the Baptist, who is ultimately identifiable, but removed from the sort of narrative context that Lippi gives us, pigging back, uh, piggy, pigging back, piggybacking, often already established tradition of saintly imagery. I hope this clarifies the role of saints in the Renaissance, however rudimentary of a treatment it was. We uh, just did something with John the Baptist that you can do a thousand times over with just John the Baptist. That does not include every other saint in the canon of Italian Renaissance figures that you can compare treatments and see how they change and see how they develop. Just to bring it all together one more time for you lovely listeners, the cult of saints in the Renaissance is left over from a very long-standing Christian tradition that goes as far back as the early Middle Ages. That tradition gave birth to the veneration of the physical aspects of saints in religious complexes, namely pieces of their bodily remains housed in highly ornate reliquaries in churches, basilicas, and cathedrals, Pilgrimage to sites of worship with relics and specific devotion to particular saints was commonplace and is still practiced today. This complex societal structure is a dominant structure that merges with new ideas of humanism and the revival of classical antiquity, creating a vivid and diverse visual culture around religious iconography by the time of the 1500s. I hope that summed it up nicely for you, and frankly, the, 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 this episode only brushes the surface of the role of the saint in Renaissance society. I also just want to note that, just like today, a common criticism is that the cult of saints is actually an act of idolatry, which is a sin, right? Which is why we have so many diverse Christian ideologies that reject this practice. I'm not a practicing Catholic, but it seems that the consensus is that, at least for the doctrines of the faith, saint reverence inspires further worship of God rather than to the saints themselves. One example that I can think of is how Mary is elevated as the mother of Jesus, not as a deity of maternity in general. I hope that's clear. Thank you so much for listening. As always, the Instagram, Facebook will be updated with loads of images and additional information on this subject. So like and follow us there. Tell me what you think. Leave a review uh, if your platform allows. Give us a rating. Write me personally. I do like that. So your support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, arrivederci.